right, so thank you very much. Uh, so happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, welcome all of you to all of you for joining us for our third Japan Studies Association's Staying Connected webinar series and apologize for technical difficulties. Although the COVID pandemic made it impossible for us to gather as usual in Hawaii for our annual conference through the wonder of Zoom, apparently updated recently, we realized that it was possible to gather and enjoy each other's company with a series of presentations furthering the mission of the JSA. Before introducing our speaker today, I need to thank my program co-chairs, Andrea Stover and Maggie Ivanova, uh, and of course, Joe Overton, JSA president, for their assistance bringing this concept together. The board of the JSA, Stacia Bensel, Bay Beecham, Jim Peoples and Dawn Gale also provided much help and advice. A double shout out goes to Dawn Gale for helping us get support for our program from the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies and for hooking us up with Jody Dietz, coordinator of Johnson County Communities Co Community Colleges Collaboration Center and Sarah Bayos and Isaiah Risby who handle the technical aspects of our program for us. Thanks much to all uh, and to all of you for joining us today. You've all become veterans of the webinar process over the last year, but they still begin jeopardy by reminding people of the rules. So in that spirit, I'll briefly run through our program today. I'll introduce our speaker and hand it over to Ethan in just a moment. Ethan will talk for about 25 minutes or so, and they'll, then we'll open it up uh, for comment and discussion. If there's a question you're just dying to ask, please submit it via the chat or question functions, and I'll put them to Ethan. Also, feel free to use the chat function to keep in touch with your fellow uh, Members, private side conversations are certainly encouraged. It's now more than 20 years since I first met our speaker today. Ethan Siegel, Associate Professor and Chair of the Japan uh, Council at Michigan State University, that's the home of all things HNET. Topics of his research and publications include medieval economic and monetary history, women and gender and nationalism. His teachings at MSU, for which he has won several awards, includes courses on topics ranging from world history and the samurai to Japanese pop culture and film. He regularly gives talks, conferences, and on, uh, on campuses uh, around the world. Today, he'll be talking from his campus to the world uh, about an event which we all experienced in one way or another, even if the earth under our feet didn't shake. Last week, we marked the 10th anniversary of 311, the great East Japan disaster. Uh, today, he'll talk about uh, Japan uh, and Tohoku 10 years on. So it's my pleasure to present to you, uh, Ethan Siegel. So take it away, Ethan. All right, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks to you, Maggie and Andrea for inviting me to give the presentation to Dawn and everyone at the University of Kansas and at uh, JCCC for making it possible and everyone in the Japan Studies Association for joining us today. Uh, I had forgotten this was supposed to be about 25, 30 minutes. So I probably have too many slides and I'll go through them a little more quickly than I might have otherwise and happy to answer any questions uh, you have about anything that I share. Um, some of the things that I'll be talking about, of course, are what happened just as a quick refresher on March 11 of 2011, some of the long term issues that resulted and some of the difficult dilemmas that we really are still we or the people of Japan anyway, are still wrestling with. I also know some people are here because you may be interested in teaching this material. So I'll talk about some lessons that have emerged from all of this and ways in which things are being remembered this month in Japan and around the world. And the truth is I've had a chance to reflect a lot on what happened back in 2011, attended a number of other webinars and other campuses or hosted by other campuses. And it really led me to kind of rethink the title. The one that I had on the first slide is the one I sent to Paul when we first set this up several weeks ago. But I almost wonder if a better title might not be this one, Japan's 311 disasters, the first 10 years, because sadly, some of these issues are still ongoing, as I hope will be clear by the time I finish my remarks. Now, for those unfamiliar with the 311 experience, let me just quickly introduce a few key terms and names. One is 311, which stands for March 11th and has the same residence in Japan that 911 has here in the United States. Another is the term Tohoku, which refers to the northeastern part of the main island of Honshu in Japan. You see it circled there in orange, or here's a close up of that same region, those six prefectures, and it's the three on the Pacific coast side, Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima, which were most directly affected by the events of March 11th. A third term is TEPCO. This stands for the Tokyo Electric Power Company. This was the utility that ran the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant that has been the attention, so much attention uh, ever since those events. And the last terms we may not come up in our conversation today, 
but the two political parties at the time, the DPJ, the Democratic Party of Japan, who's uh, had their candidate as prime minister at that time, and the LDP, which at the events of 2011 was out of power, but regained power in 2012 and has maintained that ever since. Uh, this, what I'll be sharing with you today is based in large part on site visits that I have made over the years to various affected communities, including the five that you see listed here, but not only those five. Uh, this region is one that I had the privilege to get to know even before 2011. My wife's family is from Iwate Prefecture and we had visited many of these coastal communities uh, before the events of 2011. Fortunately, my wife's family was uh, unharmed by the events, though that first 24 hours after the earthquake when we couldn't reach anybody by phone were, were very uh, scary indeed, as they were for many other people around the world. Some of the questions that I hope you'll be able to think about as we consider these events were, of course, what happened on 311 and the immediate aftermath? What happened at Fukushima? Uh, was it a natural or man-made disaster? What are the long-term challenges that people still struggle with today? And is this a uniquely Japanese story? And I'm gonna suggest for question four there, the answer is no, that the events that happened on 311 and continue to cause trouble for Japan are events that we should be very much aware of as Americans or people of whatever country you are joining us from today. So what happened on March 11th? Well, there was a major earthquake, 9.0 eventually determined on the Richter scale off the Northeast Pacific coast of Japan. You see its epicenter there off the coast of Miyagi. Um, it had not been expected. Now, Japan is very earthquake prone, but a, a quake of that size had not been expected for that region of Japan at that time. Fortunately, direct loss of life due to the earthquake was rather minimal. That's a testament to the strength of Japanese building and construction codes. Uh, I was able to find a photo, um, this one here you see of a damaged highway, but in fact, you don't see a lot of photos of, photos of buildings that collapsed or anything as a result of the earthquake. Now, what caused it was what you see here, two tectonic plates, and Japan is actually where four plates meet. And as one plate, if you can see my hands here, is pushing into the earth, it brings the other plate with us. And when that pressure eventually snaps, that causes the earthquake. It also causes a massive tsunami. Wave heights exceeded 30 meters in some places. That's close to 100 feet, the equivalent of a nine-story building, a wall of water coming onto some of these coastal communities. And this sadly resulted in tremendous loss of life and damage. You may have seen versions of this very famous photo of the water pouring over the seawall in the city of Miyako, or this city of the remains of the, of this photo rather of the remains of the city of Kesenuma with that giant boat there that you see carried quite some distance inland by the wave of water. And that tsunami not only destroyed many communities and took many lives, it also sparked a crisis at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Uh, it, it overrode the seawall at that plant as well and flooded not only the plant, but its backup generators, which unfortunately were also built at ground level. The result was the materials inside the reactors overheated, they lost power, could not be cooled, overheated and blew. And three of the six reactors experienced meltdown. Uh, a fourth reactor had hydrogen buildup that blew its containment facility. And the result was the release of radioactive materials. Uh, people had to be evacuated, crops and uh, herd animals destroyed and widespread concern in Japan and around the world. Now, Many people quickly mobilized to help the people of this region, including the Japanese self-defense forces, which acquitted themselves very well, the Japanese Red Cross, various kinds of volunteer agencies from within Japan and abroad. But there were a number of long-term issues that were not easily resolved. One of those was the problem of refugees. Uh, if we include both the tsunami and the nuclear power plant refugees, some 400,000 people, at least at some point, were displaced by the events. Uh, this was the first visit that I was able to make in the summer of 2011. Uh, we saw even then in the city of Rikuzen, Takata, some four months after the 311 tsunami, people still living, homeless people who had lost their homes, living in the gymnasium of the middle school there with obviously no privacy uh, and unsure of their fate. Now, while many communities were destroyed by the tsunami, others had to evacuate even though their homes looked beautiful, 
but because of fears of radiation. And one of my visits, I was guided by this gentleman, Mr. Otake, who was the principal of the middle school of the town of Katsurao. You can see Katsurao marked right here. He and his fellow citizens had to evacuate because of radiation concerns. This red dot is where the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located. He took me into the exclusion zone and is demonstrating here inside his school what had happened uh, in the events there. He also took me to see his temporary housing. And this is something perhaps comparable to the famous FEMA trailers after Hurricane Katrina for the people of New Orleans, though fortunately a little bit better than some of the problems with those trailers, but very, very small temporary housing. This entire community of some 200 families had this one tiny convenience store mart to kind of meet their food needs. And so if you didn't have a car, you had to rely on the bus or on the goodwill of neighbors to take you to a real supermarket, for example. As you might imagine, for those living in these conditions, it was extremely stressful. There were all kinds of other problems associated with these displaced people's communities, including hospitals had been destroyed, doctors in many cases had been lost or had moved away, so there was not enough medical care. People had difficulty finding their loved ones who had been lost in the tsunami, unemployment and depression, and the guilt of survivors, those who, although we might think fortunate to survive, felt guilty over the fact that friends and family had been lost and wondered why they themselves were still with us. Another major issue was the literal mountains of debris that were accumulated. The mayor of Onogawa, a town very close to Sendai, estimated famously that it would have taken his town a century to produce the same amount of debris that was produced on that single day. And here you see a photo again from Mikuzen Takata or from Ishinomaki, another site that I visited in March of 2012. Many other parts of Japan were reluctant to accept this debris to help with its disposal because they were concerned about radiation, even though in fact, places like Rikuzen and Taka, uh, Takata and Ishinomaki were quite far away from the nuclear power plant. Contaminated land was a third issue. So here you see images showing the spread of the radiation the nuclear power plant was located here near Futaba and Okuma. The winds were blowing to the northwest that day, so this orange and yellow plume shows how the radiation spread to the northwest. And it was extremely difficult, it still is extremely difficult to try to deal with. So here you see workers in hazmat suits attempting to collect the surface matter, the dead leaves and other things that bear this radioactive material. Or here, the same kind of thing, the scoop vehicle attempting to remove the top layer of topsoil. It's a very ineffective process because of course, some of this material collects in, as you see behind there, the trees on that hillside. So when it rains, even if you've cleaned this area, new material would wash down the hill, recontaminating it. When I visited with uh, Mr. Otake, roughly a year after those events, this was a photo outside of his school. We saw on the school playgrounds, contaminated soil, kept under tarps. Now, mind you, there are no children at this school, so it wasn't a danger to anyone, but there's no real obvious solution as to what to do with this contaminated material. You may also have seen in the press stories about contaminated water. The Fukushima plant, they are continuing to try to keep those radioactive materials cool by pumping water in. That's of course why all these plants are located near the ocean, because you need that huge supply of water to keep the materials from overheating. But as they do that, the material, the water rather, picks up radioactive materials. They've been storing it in giant tanks on site. There are about a thousand of these tanks that contain something like 1.37 million um, gallons of water, or tons of water rather, but they're running out of space. And there are plans the Japanese government has proposed to actually release some of this material into the ocean, which has many people very concerned. I can talk more about that if you'd like during the question period. There was also serious problems for the fishermen who live in these communities, and that's a major industry of the Tohoku region, particularly those who live along the coast. Many boats were destroyed, seafood processing plants as well. And of course, the seabed itself changed. So fishermen who knew to go to this particular spot to catch this kind of fish, or that spot to catch or to harvest oysters or find different kinds of kelp or seaweed, all of that was lost and had to be reestablished. In addition, even if it was safe for them to collect these materials, consumers were reluctant to buy their products. So I'm gonna blow up, zoom in on that image there on the bottom. That's what you see here. This is actually a photo from a sushi place in Hong Kong. And as you see, they're reassuring their consumers that none of the fish comes from Japan. 
This was an issue for farmers as well, many of whom had to abandon their livestock. A final issue that we should talk about long-term is nuclear power. So as you might imagine, um, nuclear power plants had to be shut down in the aftermath of this disaster. Now, Japan is not well endowed with fossil fuels. So although it may seem strange, given that Japan has been, you know, has had nuclear weapons used against it in war, in fact, post-war Japan was convinced to embrace nuclear fuel, nuclear power rather, as a fuel source, and had 54 plants producing about 30% of its electricity before March of 2011. They were all shut down and there were serious concerns about blackouts or brownouts. You would have seen signs like this if you'd been in Tokyo that summer. Um, they really didn't happen, but that's because the Japanese government spent a lot of money to purchase fossil fuels from abroad. Famously, the prime minister at the time, Prime Minister Khan, flipped his position and having lived through these events, decided that Japan needs to move away from nuclear power. However, his successor, Prime Minister Noda, was not willing to embrace that position. And when the LDP, the other party, the Liberal Democratic Party came to power, it has also refused to move away from nuclear power. But there has been a very active citizens movement trying to get the government to change its view. I had the privilege of joining some of these protesters in 2015. There's been a group of them that meets in front of the prime minister's house every Friday night for basically 10 years now to try to express their opposition to nuclear power. A final dilemma would be, is it safe to rebuild or return? Now, for those communities that were not affected by radiation, although it's very unlikely we would see another tsunami of that size again anytime soon, there's nothing that prevents it from happening. So that fear makes them very hesitant to rebuild. Here you see a photograph I took in the city of Kesenuma, that pile of dirt there of sand, they were actually planning to rebuild the entire, not the entire, but parts of the city at higher elevation a plan which they actually succeeded in doing. So elevating the town so a future tsunami would not inundate it. Another issue is demographics. So some of you may know Japan faces an increasing percentage of its population that is elderly. And this is particularly true for the Tohoku region. So these are numbers that I put together. You see in this column here, the 2010 census figures, and then the 2005 census figures. And in every case, these towns were sadly on the decline anyway. So does it make sense for the Japanese government to spend lots of money to rebuild a town that very likely in 20 or 30 years would have faded away regardless because people were not moving there, not young people anyway. And of course, those who do have children are especially reluctant to move there because of the fears of radiation. Who is to blame and who is responsible? Well. This may strike some as a natural disaster, certainly the tsunami and earthquake were. That being said, there were clear errors and misjudgments on the part of people that compounded what happened. For example, there were some scientific studies that predicted the possibility of a tsunami of this size, but TEPCO took active steps to try to suppress those from reaching the public. Um, the government also did not have adequate communication lines set up with TEPCO. So various kinds of scandals have led people to question the role of human involvement. So you see this political cartoon with everyone pointing the finger at someone else. And lest you think this is a uniquely Japanese issue, here we see a very similar political cartoon in the aftermath of 9-11. And you'll recognize Condi Rice and Bill Clinton and George Bush and others there, Madeleine Albright, all pointing the finger at someone else. So what does this mean for nuclear power in Japan? Well, Japan, because of this problem of limited fossil fuels, uh, the LDP seems determined to restart its nuclear power plants. Currently nine are operational with 18 more seeking approval to restart. And the nuclear power industry has powerful allies in politicians and bureaucrats who seem to favor this kind of policy. There's also the question of the Olympics. So when Japan was awarded the Olympics in 2013, then Prime Minister Abe, saw it as a great opportunity. They were going to call it the Recovery Olympics to tout how well this region has recovered. But in fact, many in the region feel the money would have been better spent not on the Olympics, but in helping those communities recover. And of course, some groups, you see here an article on the right from Greenpeace, claim there are still radiation concerns, particularly along the torch relay route that make it difficult for people to go there to witness the events. <laughs> 
Finally, very quickly, I'll turn to some lessons and some ways we might think about how these events are remembered and how you might bring them into your classroom. Certainly one lesson would be the dangers of hubris or the need to always be prepared. And I, you know, one obvious parallel would be the Titanic, the supposedly unsinkable ship, which of course sank on its maiden voyage. But a more relevant example would be Chernobyl in the former Soviet Union, where um, Soviet officials really believed that a disaster of that type could not happen. It of course did. And similarly, there were Japanese scientists and nuclear power plant operators who were quite confident in their ability to manage any disaster, a confidence that was proved to have been misfounded. Another really interesting set of lessons for those interested in political science in particular comes that, that crises do not necessarily lead to change. And I'm drawing now upon the work of a wonderful political scientist at MIT, Richard Samuels, and his book you see there on the left, 311 Disaster and Change in Japan, where he studied the aftermath, the political rhetoric in the aftermath of 311, noting that there were various calls. Some people who said Japan needs to put it in gear, meaning use this as a moment to bring about transformational change. Whereas others said, no, this tsunami was a once in a thousand year event. We should keep doing what we've been doing. The chances of that repeating itself are extremely slim. And finally, a group of others who said, you know what? This is evidence that nuclear power and technology are ahead of us. They're too dangerous. We should go back to an earlier simple type of life. Um, and in fact, it seems that the Model 2 people are the ones who seem to be winning the day because we're not seeing that kinds of transformational change that some people called for back in 2011. Nuclear power. So I said, this is not a uniquely Japanese story. Here you see a map showing the location of nuclear power plants here in the United States. Those are the red circles and the black dots reflect seismic activity. The United States relies on nuclear power for about 20% of our electricity. What would happen if God forbid, a similar type of disaster were to hit one of our power plants? And although that sounds kind of wild and crazy, keep in mind that for the people of Japan, having a 30 meter tsunami hit their country pre-2011 seemed equally preposterous or unlikely. Here you see an article from the New York Times, for example, talking about the Indian Point Reactor, which is close to greater metropolitan New York City. Imagine trying to evacuate New York City in an emergency. Or you see an article from Michigan Radio from my own home state of Michigan, where the Palisades nuclear power plant frequently releases small amounts of radioactive material of water into Lake Michigan, a lake that I swam in as a child and still like to visit even today. So is the, are these dangers unlikely? Yes, but are they possible? Absolutely. You know, what happens if a hurricane hits a nuclear reactor in one of the Gulf states or if a tornado, as often happens in the Midwest, were to land on a nuclear power plant here. Another more optimistic set of lessons concerns the importance of community. So here you see two different articles, the one on the left from NPR, but it's um, interviewing um, Daniel Aldrich, another wonderful um, scholar based at Northeastern University in Boston, who's done a lot of excellent research from a social science perspective, showing how important community is. What he found is, that there was a wide variation in the loss of life among these coastal communities hit by the tsunami. And one of the most important factors was the communities where people knew each other the best, where people looked out for each other, had the least loss of life in many cases. The communities where people would go next door to help a neighbor who maybe couldn't walk so well or needed a wheelchair or something and made sure they evacuated. So community matters. Or the article on the right, um, this one by a group of scholars based in Japan, showing that communities that relocated but stayed together, the people in those communities experienced less cognitive decline and less depression. I'm sure they still had some, but less than the communities where people scattered to different parts of the country. Now, I don't wanna end on such a bad note. There are certainly many ways in which the region has recovered. You see some of the important figures there from even two years later. The government created a reconstruction agency to try to make recovery a major priority. It does appear that food produced in the region is safe at this point. And all of the temporary housing communities in two of the three prefectures, Iwate and Miyagi, have been closed. People have been relocated, though there are still some temporary housing communities in Fukushima prefecture. Some communities have called their people to return. So for those of you who know the Japanese language, you'll recognize the play on words here, 
that this community is calling for people to kairu, which is both the word for frog in Japanese, but also the verb that means to return home. This is for the town of Kawa Kawauchi, which, and here you see another play on this with a, a kairu festival that they hosted, right? A return to our hometown festival. But the truth is about two thirds of the people have returned from its pre-2011 population. And a heavy percentage of those who returned are elderly people, people who can't imagine living anywhere else and who perhaps aren't quite as worried about radiation as those who are younger or have children. The town of Kesenuma that I showed you the photograph earlier that was attempting to rebuild part of the town's uh, town five meters higher, in fact, completed that task. It took seven years. And the town of Miyako, I showed you that image of the water pouring over the seawall, also rebuilt a new, higher, and improved seawall and relocated one low-lying community to higher ground, a community of about 250 homes relocated to higher ground not too far away. So there are some additional steps in place to help prevent a future tsunami from being so devastating. Ways of remembering, of course, this month, you'll find lots of those available. People in the arts, like the photography exhibit you see there on the left, or artists working to help people paint murals, like the article there on the right. Various kinds of books, literary works, like the two across the upper left there. Um, Erika Kobayashi's book, Breakfast with Madame Curie, or Yoko Tawada's book, The Emissary, which won the National Book Award. That one's available in English. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Rachel Denito, has a wonderful book about these works of fiction called Fukushima Fiction. You see its cover there on the upper right. And of course, firsthand accounts like Lucy Birmingham and David McNeil's Strong in the Rain, where they follow six people through the events of March 2011, or a wonderful scholarly book edited by Jeff Kingston called Critical Issues in Contemporary Japan that looks at many of these nuclear power plant issues. There are museums that one can visit, some of which are just opening, in fact, this month. And films, this is one I would highly recommend called Nuclear Nation. There's actually a part three in the works. And my final way of remembering, some of you may know this story, uh, the phone of the wind. A gentleman um, had established this phone as a way, it's not connected to anything, but as a way in 2010, for him to connect to his cousin who had died of illness. But when people learned of this, people have been flocking to his phone booth ever since. And it's a way for them to connect to loved ones they lost in the tsunami. And you can find news articles about this. There's also a wonderful part of an episode of the public radio program, This American Life, that features this phone booth as well. My very last slide, I promise, because I know I'm going a little bit too long here, but for those who are thinking about teaching 311, what are some ways you might bring it into your classroom? Well, I'll give you six. One, of course, would be to talk about the earthquake and tsunami from a scientific perspective. And I chose this cartoon on purpose because I got to confess, before this stuff happened, I thought a tsunami was something like that, like a big tidal wave that came in and then washed away and it was done. And if you look at any of the footage, that's not what the tsunami is like at all. Instead, it's like the ocean got turned on its side. You just see the water pouring in and behind it is more water and behind that is still more water. It doesn't look like the wave you would surf on like you see here, but instead just water pouring in with no end behind it. This question of natural or man-made disaster. And this again is nothing uniquely Japanese. We could ask a similar kind of question about almost any disaster, including some that happen here in the United States. The costs and risks of nuclear power. This again is an important issue as we think about climate change and many of our students are very aware of environmental issues and climate change. And one of the benefits of nuclear power is it does not produce greenhouse gases. It's also touted as being very cheap. However, those costs usually don't include the payments that are made to local communities to get them to host a nuclear power plant, nor of course the costs of cleanup should there be a disaster. And while there's no greenhouse gases produced, the possibility of radioactive pollution, in my mind anyway, far outweighs the benefits of limiting greenhouse gases. But there may be various views on that topic. Does it make sense to rebuild? This also is not a uniquely Japanese question. So we can think, for example, about communities here in the United States along the coast of the Carolinas, where ma massive storms often devastate those communities, or in California, where there are homes built close to areas that have are prone to mudslides or forest fires that again are often rebuilt, often with American government insurance money 
should those communities be rebuilt? In fact, the likelihood of another forest fire or mudslide happening in California is much greater than another tsunami of that size hitting the coast of Japan. And yet we continue to rebuild there. Should we? Ways that people deal with grief. This also, of course, is a universal issue. And whether you be someone interested in the arts or in that story of the phone booth of the wind, um, lots of interesting things that you might address with your students here, especially as we're living through a pandemic ourselves. And sadly, some of us on this call or some of our students may be dealing with that very real issue of dealing with grief. And lastly, the ways the arts, be they painting like what you see here or works of literature or poetry, help us think about these issues and help us deal with the very long-term consequences of those who are lost and those who survive. I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. I hope it wasn't too quick as I went through these. I'd love to talk with you further about any of the issues I've raised. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Ethan, very much for your uh, talk today. Um, I had a couple of questions just to start off. And um, so, but before that, um, we've had a question uh, in the chat about whether uh, these slides might be uh, made available uh, to folks for various reasons. So um, something to think about. Um, so on the nuclear power issue, uh, you talked about the way in which the nuclear village has proved uh, quite remarkably resilient um, uh, through all of this. That's certainly at the national level. How about at the local level? So um, yeah, the nuclear village, uh, I, I may have mentioned that term, I don't know if I did, it's basically a term used in Japan to talk about the kind of close relationship among some scientists, uh, utility people, um, the government, bureaucrats and politicians, all of whom tend to be pro-nuclear advocates, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it does appear to be very strong at the national level. At the local level, the picture is a little more mixed. Um, you will find certainly some communities that have rethought whether or not they want to have a nuclear power plant in their backyard. Um, very famously, uh, the mayor of, um, I think it was Kutaba, is actually one of the people featured in that film I mentioned, Nuclear Nation. And you kind of see him in the film going through this process himself. Now, what's really interesting is many of the communities in Japan that host nuclear power plants are A, rural, and B, rather poor. And so they're given huge subsidies and agreement for them hosting a power plant. And of course, those power plants not only bring those subsidies, but they provide jobs. So mm -hmm. most of the people in a town like Futaba or Okuma were employed in the plant. Or if they weren't directly employed in the plant, they, you know, they provided lunch to the plant employees or they did the dry cleaning or something. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. giving up on these plants is controversial. And you'll find some people in these communities who both want to see them come back and others who are opposed to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of why, of course, not all these plants have restarted yet. Um, I think the national government would be happy to see them restart, but there's been some opposition at the local level. So um, getting to some of the questions from our uh, attendees, uh, Faye Beecham asks, um, how would the disaster be thought to be man-made beyond um, building nuclear power plants? What other aspects of it might make it, um, might be considered you know, something that humans set themselves up for? Right. So um, there are a whole number of things, right? One would be, of course, the location so close to the coastline. Now, there were reasons for that. As I mentioned earlier, they need the water for cooling, but perhaps there are ways that could have been set back a little further to not make them quite as vulnerable to tsunami. In the case of Fukushima Daiichi, certainly one of the design flaws that became, seems glaringly apparent now, but did not at the time, was the fact that their backup generators were at ground level. Had those backup generators been elevated, perhaps they would not have been flooded and this would not have happened. A third example, as I mentioned, is the, um, the utilities efforts to suppress scientific studies, which raised the possibility of a tsunami of this size hitting the coast. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you just a fourth because I could go on forever with this. <laughs> uh, but a fourth would be um, the lack of effective communication between the government and the utility. Um, there was no direct phone line, for example. So when the phone lines went down, there was no way easily for the government and the utility people on site to talk to each other. They had mm -hmm. to bring in emergency lines to have that happen. These mm -hmm. are all things that could have easily been, you know, again, I have the benefit of hindsight, but they sure seem like they could have been anticipated and prepared for and would have, they could have changed the tsunami, but they could have minimized its impact. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And there's also the interesting phenomenon of declaring sometime in the 80s or in post Chernobyl that the nuclear industry in Japan was 100% safe. Right. And therefore, being 100% safe, it couldn't be made any better because it's already perfect. And there we get into my point about hubris again, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Exactly. So Don Gale asks uh, if you could say a bit more about uh, contaminated water storage at Fukushima Daiichi and government plans to release uh, some of that uh, into the ocean and um, how what public information is being made available on this? So there is actually, I can, uh, I don't know if I could do it while I'm speaking. I could send maybe the link to Paul later who can perhaps forward it to people or something. Um, there is information available, um, including information both from the utility and from the Japanese government. The branch of government is called METI, which is what mm -hmm. used to be METI, and I'll get the acronym wrong, but basically it's something like Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry or something like there that. There you go, there you go, you got okay. it. Um, so uh, they both have information available, including in English on this phenomenon. They've been collecting this water. Um, as I said, a thousand of these giant water tanks, they have run out of space or they will run out of space by next year. Um, they are able to remove most of the radioactive materials from the water. The one element that they can't is an element called tritium, which I believe is some kind of heavy form of hydrogen. And they're not yeah, able to pull that. It's H2O with three um, electrons, I guess. Yeah, it's got extra, it's not kind of heavy hydrogen. But anyway, they can't remove that. Now they claim, and there is science, including from the International Atomic Agency, that claims small amounts of tritium in the water are not dangerous. And the whole point is they're not going to release all thousand tanks at once. This would happen gradually over a long period of time, and that it would be diluted in the regular water and therefore not really pose any risk to human health or to the health of the seafood in the water. Um, I personally would like to be a little more convinced. I'm not quite there yet, but no one's asking me, so I don't know if that really matters. Mm -hmm. um, so the good news, I guess, is, is if this happens, um, it won't be they're releasing pure radioactive water into the ocean, um, but it still is a source of concern. And the reason they're doing this is they need more space on site to build the structure they need to decontaminate the radioactive fuel materials that are still located in reactors one, two, and three. At least that's what they claim. So um, Yamada Sego, who is uh, joining us from Nagasaki, uh, asks, um, do you happen to know how mental problems of the victims have been uh, dealt with? Uh, it is not well reported in Japan. Uh, it is embarrassing to ask this question, uh, he notes. Well, please don't be. It's a very important issue um, and one that sometimes people are very reluctant to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not an area of my own expertise, though I have read some articles as I showed in my slide presentation. Um, there have been efforts to try to deal with these issues, perhaps not as much as I anyway would like to see happen. Um, I know there's been some excellent scholarship actually on uh, the involvement of religious communities by people like Levy McLaughlin, who's published on this. Um, mm -hmm. And there've been a lot of relatively recent articles in journals that deal with topics of mental health, including one I may have shown in the slide presentation um, on you know, the rates of suicide, which are very alarming in this for survivors among this community. Mm -hmm. um, Alexis Dudden, who's a fantastic historian at the University of Connecticut, published a few years ago an article where she um, claims that she has evidence to suggest that this, the number of deaths from people who did not die in March of 2011, but died later due to stress or other kinds of health-related issues is mm -hmm. actually greater than the number of people who died on 311 itself which is uh, incredibly tragic. Certainly in Japan, um, you will see lots of programs like the NHK specials that are on so frequently that highlight the struggles of people to deal with these issues. Um, and there are some professionals who are starting to address them, but perhaps not as openly as they would here in the United States, unfortunately. Well, a, another source which we listed among our suggested readings, uh, per, uh, David Richard Perry's um, Ghost of the Tsunami, yeah. Uh, yeah. which also talks about in a very, through, you know, individual stories, but in a very comprehensive way, talks about all of the problems that you mentioned, including the guilt of survivors and the need to find some kind of accountability. Uh, and you know, where do you go to pursue those sorts of things? Um, Dawn Gale also asks, are there issues ongoing regarding the discrimination of people who may have been exposed to radiation from the 311 disaster? Sure. Um, so, Yes, it's, it's certainly not as bad as the issues surrounding those who were survivors or children of survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, but there are some issues and 
just recently in one of these NHK programs that I mentioned and that my wife and I were watching, you know, we uh, heard interviews with children who had had to relocate. And when they relocated, were basically afraid to tell their peers in their new school where they had come from because they were mm -hmm. afraid either they would be shunned or they would be teased um, as children who were, had been exposed to radiation. Um, so those issues are very real. Um, just a couple of years, I think it was about 2013 or so, I was in Japan visiting, um, excuse me, actually at the home of one of the professors I know very well there. And he had some of his former students over for a kind of dinner party that we were all participating in, one of whom worked for a local government in Chiba Prefecture. And she was talking, they were asking her about, you know, relocated families that had, been come, that had come to Chiba and with their efforts, the local government's efforts to help those people resettle. And she said, on the one hand, they were eligible for these subsidy payments. But on the other hand, the local government literally had someone go with the family when they went grocery shopping to make sure the money wasn't being misused. I don't really know what misused would mean. Does that mean to buy alcohol or gambling or something? Mm -hmm. But I mean, imagine how horrible this would be to have number one, lost your home, number two, been relocated, and then number three, have to have some government person watching over your shoulder as you buy your groceries, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely there has been some stigma associated with this, um, though fortunately, as I said, not quite as bad as in some other cases. Mm -hmm. um, Bet Duthridge Corp uh, notes that around 41,000 uh, have yet to return uh, to their uh, hometowns. Is there uh, an increased campaign or efforts to bring them home? And does the reconstruction agency um, have any involvement in uh, those campaigns? Uh, that's a great question. Or abetting? I'm sorry? Are they aiding or abetting? Aiding or abetting, indeed. Uh, I'm sure they're aiding. I, I, I don't know this. I haven't done research into that. But if I were a betting man, uh, I would say they're a, a, um, aiding rather than abetting. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the government is eager for people to go home. It has supported those calls for return, such as the one I showed you from Kawachi. Um, that being said, everything I've seen on the numbers, I saw an article from earlier this year. Uh, this was a blog article, so but still suggested only about 33% or so of people have returned to some of these communities. Some of them are still off limits, including Daba itself. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are okay for partial return. So I visited um, uh, Minami Soma and the person there who was guiding me. We literally could drive up to a certain point in the city and then you had to stop. You couldn't go any further. Um, and, but not only are there only limited numbers of returnees, but in every case, it seems the preponderance of returnees are people who are in their elderly years, who either just cannot imagine living anywhere else, who lived their whole life in that community, or because they're you know in advanced years and, and figure the risks of that causing cancer may not be that much higher than the risks of cancer as a member of the general population or something. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, have decided they're willing to make that risk to return, but there are not as many younger people returning or people with children. And of course, what that means long-term is the community's chance of survival is, is slim, right? Because if you don't have young mm -hmm. people growing up there, you're not likely to attract many people as, as adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were uh, a number of good New York Times articles uh, last week regarding this. And one of them was, you know, um, certain communities, basically, you know, it's, it's time to give up the fight, basically. It's just a few of the very elderly who are returning. And so uh, these communities will probably not be uh, able to return. So um, one thing you also mentioned, uh, which I had a little experience with, is um, what uh, Andrew Gordon has been looking at called, you know, disaster tourism. Yes. Uh, in the spring of, in May of 2019, uh, I was actually giving lectures on a cruise ship sailing from Japan to Alaska. Uh, and our first stop out of Yokohama was Miyako. Uh, we were apparently the first cruise ship to dock in Miyako. Wow. They were very, very happy to see us and um, took us around and did a number of, um, among other things, stopped in the small coastal community of Tone, saw the Tone Hotel, which six story um, reinforced concrete metal frame, the bottom floor, uh, four floors had been washed away. Uh, you can go up to the fifth and sixth floor and see a video of what happened that day. Uh, and we were conducted there by uh, a, a woman who had lost family members um, and was very eager to tell her story. And I was very much struck how similar 
that experience was to going to Hiroshima or Nagasaki and talking to Hibakusha, people who want um, to have their stories told and understand, have people understand uh, what that experience was like. And um, I'm thinking that's kind of a, a very powerful part of um, this uh, new experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as you might imagine, there are hundreds of thousands of people affected. And so there's a wide range of willingness to talk about these experiences. The first city that we were able to visit was Rikuzen Pakata. This was July of 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and I showed you that photograph of the middle school gymnasium. Now you noticed I did not include any people in that photograph. That was intentional. Um, mm -hmm. When we were direct, so the first place we went to was the temporary city hall because the original city hall had been wiped out. Mm -hmm. And we met with a couple of city hall officials who were willing to speak to us. And they alerted us to the middle school where the gymnasium was hosting the people. And of course, the first thing we did was go to the people who were the, I don't want to say people in charge, but for lack of a better term, I'll, I'll say that. Um, and they, while we waited outside, went into the space and they, of course, who were known to the residents said, is there anyone who wants to talk to this, you know, American scholar um, who's here and, and wants to hear your story? And so they, you know, the person who was willing to speak to me was, you know, self-selected. She mm -hmm. was willing to tell her story and I didn't bother anyone else because mm -hmm. I'm sure there were plenty of people who the last thing they wanted was someone like me poking around in their personal business. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a wide range of such reactions. Um, obviously I, I showed you, uh, I could call that slide up again quickly, but those two museums, I had, it was a very quick slide. Those are both actually um, the remains of elementary schools. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them, Okawa Elementary might be the more famous, um, really tragic set of events where um, the school had an evacuation policy in place, but the people didn't think the tsunami was going to be as high as it was and were unsure whether they should try to evacuate up the hill Keeping in mind, they had a lot of very small children who have had trouble, I guess, climbing the hill. So most of the people decided to wait where they were in place. And something like 74 of the 75 children and I think 10 of the staff lost their lives that day. Um, but they decided, you know, to preserve the school, not as a school anymore, but as a museum. Um, and again, this is not a uniquely Japanese issue. We might readily call to mind the aftermath of what happened in Sandy Hook, Connecticut when there was that horrible massacre by a crazed gunman. Um, in that case, they chose to destroy the building. The local residents did not want to see it preserved. So you can imagine a wide range of responses to these kinds of disasters. So um, Adam Cauldron asks, um, the 311 disaster seems to fit into modern Japan's longer history of environmental industrial disasters. And he references Brett Walker's Tarxic Archipelago uh, in that respect. Um, obviously, Fukushima Daiichi is a bit more public um, than say um, others, uh, but um, has the Fukushima disaster led to any reevaluation of these previous incidents or Japan's environmental policy as a whole, or has the focus been strictly on nuclear energy? Uh, no, uh, a great question. And that's a wonderful book. Um, uh, Brett Walker's book, Toxic Archipelago. Um, indeed, I do think there has been some broader consideration, at least by members of the scholarly community. Um, there are a few really outstanding articles that you would find in Japan Focus, the Asia Pacific Journal, which is available online if anyone wants to read it. Um, I could think of one in particular, I think it was by Tim George, where he compares Minamata. Uh, mm -hmm. Minamata was a fishing community on Kyushu and the local chemical plant was dumping, I think it was methyl mercury. Yep. I may get the chemical wrong, but um, some kind of heavy chemicals into the uh, bay that produced all kinds of horrible consequences for the local residents. Um, and there's a very powerful, Tim George is one of our best scholars on this incident and a very powerful article where he compares Fukushima and Minamata. There's even a scene where he has um, the head of the Chiso chemical factory drinking water to prove it was clean, which was fake. It was not the actual water. Mm -hmm. And then a similar photograph from the mayor of Tokyo, Ishihara Shintaro, doing the exact same thing, drinking supposedly purified water that was not purified. Mm -hmm. um, so suggesting there has been a long-standing policy, at least among some people in power, be they corporate officials or government officials, to try to convince the public of safety, um, even when in fact they were misleading the public in that regard. Um, I don't know how much the government itself has made that linkage, but certainly among scholars, um, mm -hmm. that linkage is being made. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deb Williams asks, um, uh, 
are people pushing for alternative energy options uh, to nuclear energy? Sadly, this underscores the very real fact that alternative energy options are not without costs. Absolutely. Um, so this, in my mind anyway, was a, a missed opportunity. Um, and this is nothing, this is not my own original thought by any means. Um, back in 2012, I think it was, I had the chance to attend a conference. Um, this was really aimed primarily at people doing startup companies. Mm -hmm. uh, it was held in Shitachi, so close to Fukushima, but not part of Fukushima. Um, but they were really focused on the aftermath of Fukushima. And there were many entrepreneurs there who were saying, you know, this is our moment. We should use this as a chance to remake Japan as the greatest green power in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Relaunch all these renewable, and some of these companies were renewable energy enterprises. Which uh, Germany actually decided that you know, that's what they were going to do. When they were going to do. Yes, Germany indeed in the aftermath of Fukushima basically said they were going to move completely away from nuclear power, though it's a slightly disingenuous proclamation because their power grid is linked to France's power grid and France mm -hmm. is like 80 percent nuclear power. So but but I still I applaud Germany for its decision. I'm not mm -hmm. knocking them. Just keep that in mind. Right. Um, in the Japanese case, uh, there certainly have been such calls. The government position was it would take 10 years for us to build up our renewable energy infrastructure to the degree that we could really move away from nuclear power. Well, here we are now 10 years later. Don't mm -hmm. you wish they would have made that investment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it has not happened. I do think there is increasing reliance on renewables. So current Prime Minister Suga last fall made some bold proclamations about Japan's energy policy moving forward. He wanted, I think by 10, 2050, for Japan to be carbon neutral, which is very ambitious. Um, he did definitely tout increased reliance on renewables, but he still saw something like a 20% role for nuclear energy to play, which you know poses continued risk. So one of the institutions that, for want of a better word, came out as a winner uh, in all of this was the self-defense forces. And I wonder if you could comment a bit on sort of their institutional standing, if you will, 10 years later. Sure. So um, many in the audience may already know this, but Japan's current constitution, which was the constitution put in place in 1947 and kind of ghost written and to some degree imposed. Actually, by, actually written. Well, actually written. Yeah. But it wasn't touted that way at the time. Right. So that's why he's ghost written. But anyway, kind of imposed on them by the Americans who were occupying Japan after the end of World War II says that Japan, in its famous Article 9, Japan renounces the right to use war as a means of settling international disputes, and it's not supposed to maintain basically a military. Um, even before the ink was dry, practically, mm -hmm. the, not only the Japanese, but the Americans themselves were kind of regretting that provision. As the Cold War became more a bigger part of foreign policy, the Americans would have loved to have seen a Japanese military able to play a role in affairs in the Pacific region. Um, the constitution has never been changed, but the Japanese did create these self-defense forces, which some have challenged the legality of in the courts. The courts so far have not forced the Japanese government to get rid of them. And they're actually a relatively big military compared to other militaries around the world. Um, they're not supposed to be used for war, uh, but the real issue came up in 1995 when there was a major earthquake close to the city of Kobe, often called the Han Great Hanshin earthquake, um, and the government at the time was slow to call the self-defense forces in to help people. I actually had a very good friend. I was living in Seattle at the time. A very good friend of mine was from Kobe. She went back to help her family pick up the pieces. And when she returned to Seattle, she told me the most effective force in helping people recover was the Yakuza, which mm -hmm. mobilized very quickly, right? This is the Japanese mafia. Mm -hmm. In any event, there was a lot of criticism of the Japanese government for not sending in the self-defense forces to help people. When 2011 happened, this was one case where the government learned from its mistakes. They sent the Japanese self-defense forces in quickly, and by all accounts, they acquitted themselves very well. Uh, we actually, when my wife and I went to Rikazen Takata in 2011, we saw the self-defense forces there in operation, and people had nothing but praise for them. Mm -hmm. So that certainly has helped their bid to win legitimacy in the minds of the Japanese public. Mm -hmm but not necessarily translated into larger budgets or anything no. like that. Well, government is government, no matter where right. you go. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we've come to the end of our time. So I wanna thank uh, Ethan once again for your wonderful talk today. Um, so in regards to uh, future programming, 
Um, thanks once again to uh, Ethan and the members of the JSA board, to Don Gale in particular, and Jody Dietz and Sarah Bayos and Isaiah Reesby of the JCCC CoLab uh, and the University of Kansas uh, Center for East Asian Studies for their support. Uh, our next program is slide, slated for mid-April, but timing and details have yet to be fully worked out. Uh, so I'll ask you all to keep an eye on the JSA website. We also hope to have some interesting uh, programs going uh, for May. Uh, maybe in that time, we'll actually uh, fix the spelling of webinars, so it's not webinars. Um, so information on uh, our evolving program schedule will be available on the JSA website, Japan Studies. Dot org. Thanks very much to everyone and have a lovely day. So thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks very much everyone for attending and for your question. Uh.